Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Derek Willis. Uh, I teach at uh, the University of Maryland, College Park. I'm a journalism lecturer here. And so uh, I want to sort of begin um, by telling you a little bit about sort of uh, what I'm going to talk about, which is essentially I have a, a journalism class that I'm teaching this semester in which we give students the opportunity to experiment with AI, to apply generative AI to journalism tasks, and then to uh, see how that goes. Uh, I've kind of uh, called this running with scissors uh, because uh, this is not only a first time class, but it's the first time trying to teach these kinds of uh, things. Uh, and so we're, there's a lot of experimentation and a lot of unknowns here. So uh, I do welcome your questions in the chat. So please uh, uh, have them coming. Um, all the images generated in these slides are uh, images generated by AI, so most of them are terrible in some ways. Uh, also, the link, uh, the link in the slides uh, on that first slide is to these slides. Uh, so if you want a copy of them, they are there, but you could also get them from uh, from the, the event itself. So, um, so uh, this journalism class is about 17 students, uh, varying skill levels, uh, one non-journalism major included in them. I asked them before the course began uh, what they think the impact of generative AI would be on journalism. They were mostly unsure. Uh, and I wanted to make this class uh, less technical than I personally am. I'm uh, an early adopter. I'm a geek. I'm sort of immersed in this stuff. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that we were actually reaching students who were not necessarily where I was or as comfortable uh, as I was. I, in fact, I've got a couple students in the class who had no generative AI exists, but prior to the class had never used it, which is exactly what we what we wanted. Um, the the setup of the class, the structure is that we apply AI to individual tasks that journalists do, uh, common tasks, uh, regular sorts of traditional things, and I'll talk a little bit more about them. Um, and then we, in doing so, we ask them to use different kinds of AI services, some of which are paid. Uh, we got a grant from the university to help us cover the costs for providing access to some of the paid versions of some of these services for our students. But we do do use a lot of free stuff because as an industry, journalism is pretty cheap and doesn't like to spend money on things. And we don't want to provide an environment for our students where we're like, yeah, you're going to get access to all these expensive things when you go out into the field, because mostly they are not. The catch with this class, though, uh, is that I don't, as I told the students, like the first the first couple of weeks, I don't really know how I'm going to grade you on right answer, wrong answer basis, because I don't know what the right answers are. And I don't you know, like we might get to them, but we might also might not. Uh, and so what we ended up kind of settling on was I mostly grade them on effort uh, in terms of like their ability to do these tasks, but also to reflect on them and evaluate what they're doing. Um, motivation has not been an issue in this class, thankfully, because it is interesting. Uh, it is uh, something that they're all curious about. Um, uh, even though it's a 9 a.m. class, uh, they still actually are pretty motivated to do the work here, which has been good. So it does present a challenge for grading, though, that I'll talk about in a little bit. So here's, uh, for example, here's this kind of a sample task. Um, uh, summarizing ideas, potentially story ideas, finding those ideas from some kind of report. Maybe that's a governmental uh, document of some kind uh, or some other report that's been produced. Um, and what we do is, uh, what I do is I give our students a, an evaluation template that they fill out. The date of that task, what we're calling it, uh, you know, what group or team they're with, um, which large language models they're using. They have to then share with me a, a transcript sort of of their conversation with that AI or AI systems that they use. <clears throat> and they have to describe their processes which is really important for me because I have to kind of understand where, where their heads are at, but also what their expectations are for how this conversation is going to go. And early on, they were pretty deferential to these systems, thinking like, oh, these systems seem pretty smart. And then if you're like me and you've used some of these systems, what you quickly realize is the human brain is still a wonderful, magical, amazing instrument. And we ought to be really uh, like we ought not to underestimate its power. Uh, and abilities, especially compared with some of these systems. 
Uh, I respect the wonderful rules and powers of mathematics, but the human brain is much more than that, right? So documentation though is key here. Getting them to talk about and, and write down what they've done is really important in this process. So the other step that's really, really like is most important. The thing that I actually grade them on the or like prioritize, emphasize the most in grading them is their evaluations. And so I asked them to tell me essentially how it went and what they think of the, the outcome of, their, of this process of doing these tasks. And I want them to be judgmental and critical about these systems because they quickly realize that they do have, uh, I mean, quirks is a charitable word for it, but flaws, or they, they, they do have sort of tendencies that sometimes are helpful for tasks and unhelpful for other kinds of tasks. And so I try to frame it as your expectations versus your outcome. Is this helpful? Uh, is this better than humans alone? Um, and for team exercises, for group exercises, I usually have a team Luddite, which is not always the same people, thankfully. Team Luddite doesn't get to use AI at all. They just have to like, if it's, a, like, if it's generating story ideas from a report, they have to read the report. And they don't love being on Team Luddite, except when they come up with better ideas. And then they really love being on Team Luddite. And, and I think it's important for us to kind of keep folks aware, keep our students aware of the human role in this, uh, because we could kind of have a technic, you know, techno triumphalism about, uh, about the way that we teach and interact with these systems that, that I think is unhelpful and unrealistic, and frankly, also limits, like limits uh, both the learning and also like the potential growth in our, in our own use and evaluations of these systems. So here's like a, a, a sort of sample assignment from our uh, learning management system. You may recognize uh, the uh, general fonts and color schemes. Um, and this one was particularly like uh, parsing an image. Uh, so we, we went to the Library of Congress, their digital collections, got a couple of, I asked them to pick a couple of images and then upload those to an AI system and ask questions, ask it to describe that image. What, you know, could it, could it tell you things about, uh, aspects of it, or could it tell you, describe like the setting? Uh, if it's a architectural image, could it identify the architect even, even without, you know, without it being listed, things like that. Most of the other tasks, uh, you see a sample of them on the left, um, you know, like they, they are, these are traditional things that reporters and editors do. And that's what we tried to do here. Even if it was kind of nonsensical, we tried to at least say, well, what if we tried using AI for this? And sometimes the answer comes back, yeah, this isn't a good use. And it's important that students, I think, know that as well. So the, um, the tough part about, the other tough part about this class, in addition to sort of evaluation, is things just keep happening, which is super annoying when you're trying to plan a class. Like, uh, and I wanna give you one example of that. I uh, came in uh, one Tuesday and we were talking about transcribing or tools that would describe video like describe the images, imagery, or background in video or what's going on in video. And on a Tuesday, we use that tool, but it stripped out the audio. So you couldn't ask questions of the audio. By the time we met on Thursday morning, less than 48 hours later, that tool had changed and could actually describe what was going on in the audio for you. Uh, and so like, that's kind of annoying to deal with uh, as, a, as an instructor, but also it's really instructive to, for the students to see just how fast this is going, right? Uh, the tools that we use, probably familiar with folks who have any familiarity with uh, AI, uh, ChatGPT, Claude from Anthropic, Gemini from Google. Uh, there's a fun little one called Notebook LM from Google that seems to be like a side project because they don't publicize it at all. It is mostly a document-based kind of system, which is it works when you up, it starts to work when you upload a document to it. Uh, among the open source models that you can run on your own computer, depending on how fast your computer is, uh, Meta's Llama 3 is, uh, has been pretty good um, for now. Like for now, it's mostly paid folks, uh, services that are really good, but I suspect that will change as well. Um, lastly, I just wanna finish up quickly with two things. Uh, for major assignments, in addition to those regular tasks, I had students adopt a news organization to draft policies and processes for its use, uh, use of AI. Uh, and for a group sort of major assignment, 
to pick one of those tasks that we had done and really do a deep dive into that and write like a guide, uh, a, genero, a g- generic guide that journalists could use to be like, I want to learn how to use AI to do this. That's what we're going to be producing. And I'm really looking forward to that because I'm really going to try and publish some stuff around that uh, because I think it'll be helpful. So some quick lessons. These aren't fact machines. You don't use them like fact machines. Don't ever do that. They're terrible fact machines. They're probabilistic predictors. That's what they do. Um, that human role is really, really critical. Uh, and it's trained on our work. Uh, so, you know, humans are always going to be involved in this stuff. Um, different AI systems seem to work differently, uh, not only for the same task, but for different tasks. And, and, and it's good to do comparative stuff. And finally, uh, chat-based interfaces, they're pretty good until they aren't. And we need to think about what other, like what else we could do, what other kind of interfaces, how we could interact with these language models that isn't just based on chat. So uh, questions, comments, uh, links to the, both the slides and the uh, syllabus uh, for my class, if you're interested in that, uh, are available to you. Um, and so uh, I will, uh, happy to entertain some questions you've got. All right, let me kick them off with, this is a long one. Supposedly. Sure. Uh, Reuters research suggests news story outputs from AI tools are heavily influenced by whether news sites have chosen to block news crawlers. Do you discuss this? For example, research just released in February showed 48% of the most widely used news websites across 10 countries were being blocked by open AI, smaller number by Google's crawlers. Um, the researchers also noticed that 82% of the news-like outputs in chat GPT were producing referral links to home pages, not the stories. Mm-hmm. There's actually a second question. So can you go with the first one? Yeah. So the first, uh, when I say the first question is like, this does have, clearly has like implications for journalism's role in uh, serving information needs in democracy. I think um, I think the point of of training these is that, like, again, that the, they are not fact machines. I think they are really good at, like, I wouldn't use them to like look up specific information about a an event, for example. Like, I don't, I don't think that's the best use for them. I think the best use for them is taking something that either you already know or you can give to that to an AI system, and then asking creative questions that as a launch pad as a way to kind of grow from there uh and so it is a problem though that in terms of training materials and their access to training materials i suspect you've also seen in addition to news news organizations blocking ai crawlers you've also seen some of them negotiate deals with these same companies to provide their content to them in a pipeline the associated press has done this uh, other companies other news organizations have done this uh and I suspect that will be, that will actually be the practice, um, so that that these AI companies will not have to do crawlers. Um, Google's going to be a special case because you need them to do crawlers if you want to be sort of known on the internet. But uh, I think the other aspect of this is like we're very likely to see the definition of fair use redefined by some federal judge or court in the next five to ten years, um, and. Uh, I mean, probably about time that it is redefined to uh, adjust for technology, but it will be interesting about that, that to see about that. Uh, but like, I'm not that I'm not concerned about it, but I like I think if you're using them to research specific things, like specific events and ideas, I like I'm not sure that's the best use. Hmm. There is a comment that paid paid ones have newer information, a specific event that would only work well if the AI was trained yesterday. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that's, what the question is asking, but of course we know that most of the uh, AI is not as up to date as what we're putting out there now. But if you're using with your students, any of these tools, they're not going to have today's news. So it's a yes. general, yes. A general and, bigger and- problem of access to information that is current, that Yes, and I, and and uh, that's very true. Um, what you can do, however, is that you can give them information. Oftentimes, our in assignments, our students, I ask our students to upload or to copy and paste. Here's the text of this story into an AI system, and then it's like then it is aware of it mm-hmm. and knows about it. But I would really caution against these as against thinking of these as like some sort of encyclopedia 
uh, or reference source because that that is not what they were built to do. They are mm-hmm. built to be like they are probabilistic predictors. They they try to like predict the next word uh, in in an output in response to what you're asking or inputting into their chat interfaces, and that's not how you want like facts to work. <laughs> you don't want it to be like the most likely word here. Maybe sometimes it is correct, right? Because if you say what's the capital of Paris of France, it will say Paris because that is the most probabilistically the very most likely word in response to that query. But that is not the same thing as as like what is the only response here? I'm not seeing many other questions, so I can keep going on if there aren't any. Did you consider a follow-up assignment having the students apply this knowledge to something like an actual news story? I mean, do you send them yes. out on the street? Do so I, I I don't uh, I don't send them out on the street for this particular class. But what I have done is is uh, we have other college classes at the college where they do our reporting things, and I encourage them to bring those assign essentially to see if AI can be applied to those assignments. Um, uh, we also have made rather significant use of a of generative AI in uh, investigative projects that mm-hmm. occurring at at the the at the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism here at, at UMD. And in particular, they are uh, we're using them to extract to structure unstructured information. Great. So like we have a large pile of text and we want to get some sense out of that. Maybe it's like, you know, turn it into extract information and put it into kind of a rows and columns type form. Um, AI systems are very, very good at doing that. Um, and you can provide guidance and guardrails to limit, not wholly eliminate, but limit the amount of hallucinations that they produce it, when they when you ask to do those tasks. So. Um, how, do you, how do you respond though to students who are concerned about the future of their own job if so much yes. an increasing yeah. amount of work is being done by AI? Yeah, so uh, this is, we talk about this all the time. And I think like the bottom line for me is If there are things that AI can do well, tasks that AI alone can do well, um, those are probably tasks that you don't want to be doing as a journalist. Um, And so like uh, what I usually say is like, our brains are built for higher order tasks and we should be using them for those tasks. And if you're doing a manual or, or mostly manual repetitive task as a human, like think about when you've had to do data entry, like all of us have probably had to do data entry. It's terrible, we're bad at it because it's not what our brains are built for. And so like, I think like the problem is, the threat here is, is that there are a bunch of jobs right now or tasks right now that journalists are doing that are manual and are repetitive. And I think that is gonna cause some people to sort of say, well, we don't need people to do those jobs. Mm -hmm. That's sort of like, economically probably true in in some sense i think the right way to approach that scenario is what else could we have these people do that machines can't do for us um while ai or these other systems are are actually improving our uh ability to do journalism writ large i think i describe these we talk about these as systems as like exoskeletons essentially like stuff that you put on you to make you more capable. Um, the, the, the difficulty with that right now is that like these systems as they are designed and, and working right now, they are making, they're very good at turning experts into more efficient experts. If you're already an expert, you're gonna be better because of these systems. Yeah. If you're not an expert though, they will not make you an expert, <laughs> these systems. <laughs> They Which will sometimes leads to a question, actually, Derek. Yeah, they, they I... will sometimes deceive you into thinking yeah. you're an expert and you're not. So, mm-hmm. like, that's tough. So, do you find that uh, teaching critical thinking skills actually distracts from getting to some of the other objectives that you were trying to get at in this class? Because you have to teach so much to the critical thinking skill need to, to develop. No, I mean, it. It's limiting in some, only in the sense that like, we don't get to spend as much time on like going deep in individual tasks, but no, I think like you, like using these as a, 
Like if you're going to use these for something that you really need to think about, and there are uses that, that are fall into that category, then you, you absolutely have to have those critical thinking skills to make good use of it. Um, you, you don't necessarily need as much of it for some of the, you know, more, I would say mindless tasks, frankly, more repetitive stuff. Like, Hey, I need to turn this, this one pile of text into some other pile, like a differently structured pile of text. That doesn't require a ton of critical thinking skills to, to devise and implement, but mm -hmm. like you will need those skills in order to sort of be able to judge the output and decide, is this something that we should do a lot of, or is this something that we need to have a very careful, uh, very careful, very well-defined process that governs how we do it? Um, and, and documenting that, I think, is what makes that lesson become more real for our students. Uh, so for our final question, before I say goodbye to everyone, and thank you to both the speaker and the folks here, uh, Jaime has asked a question about um, a follow-up on the unemployment issue. Yeah. Uh, if I can interpret it, oh, I'm going to try. Uh, so it's not that they'll be unemployed. It's just that there'll be fewer of them employed because some of the junk tasks we do as journalists will be turned over to the machines. That's my ideal. Like, that's my ideal is that um, they will free up, free us up from doing stuff that I don't want to do uh, as a reporter. Except um, the obits and things like that are the kinds of stuff that we start training our students to be able to organize yes. their ideas. And that is yes. junk stuff. Well, yes and no. I mean, like, for example, like, like there's a formulaic way to do obits. And then there's like the way the economist do, uh, does obits. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to say, look, you can do commodity obits if you want. Like if you, you can do a obits as a commodity or baseball stories as a commodity, but recognize that doing that is incredibly risky for your employment future. Because if it is a commodity, by definition, almost anybody or any system could do it for you and you're not going to be, or you could be replaced by someone else who's going to do it for cheaper. But Jaime is exactly right. If you develop an expertise, a real skill, a real 